Hello and good evening to anyone who has joined me and I'll just let you know exactly what we're doing today. So this is a recording about COVID vaccine myocarditis implications. As you can know, it's on Eventbrite and the first part of this discussion will be live on a couple of platforms. But the truth be told, when it comes down to looking at the nitty gritty of the science, I'll have to take you off because I need to be able to reflect on what the science is saying without being too concerned about censorship. That's the reality. And so therefore I'm doing it in two phases. So I'll give an overview as to what I'm talking about and the general idea. But then for those who are with me on Eventbrite, we'll go through some of the questions. So I'll do the sections, then we'll ask some questions, we'll discuss some of the points, and then I'll move from section to section in that kind of way. And so we're just focused on the principles around the, uh, the potential implications of myocarditis. And so I'll get straight into the overview before we go into the details of the research. <clears throat> so, this is me again. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I'm sharing with you important scientific reflections. And what I'm trying to do is I am taking the scientific studies and thinking about it from a clinical perspective and trying to see if I can apply that understanding in a way that works clinically. And so, I think that I usually take a slightly different perspective and I'm trying to see if I can integrate the two things together. So what I'm focused on today, the key learning objectives are to do with discovering the significance of myocarditis and what could be the link with regards to COVID vaccines. Now we do know that it happens and most of the research out there would have said that it is quite rare. I think the concern that I'd highlighted before, which we'll come to later on, is that the, the detail of research that was applied with regards to infection wasn't used with vaccines. So it's not necessarily fair to say that it's rare when you haven't done adequate scientific study on it. I'll be talking quickly about the heart function and how this relates to myocarditis. So a quick overview of the anatomy and some of the pathology around it. I'll be looking at the major research reports. So I have picked four of them, which I'll show you later on about vaccine induced myocarditis and try and integrate what I'll be talking about. And then I'll be trying to reflect on what does it mean going forward. And it's important to recognize that it's not just about in the moment, because people are talking about, well, so, so what if it happens to a few people? But if it happens more frequently and subclinically especially, and you don't know that it has occurred, especially in the younger cohort, this can have long-term impacts. And so therefore it shouldn't be ignored. And so myocarditis simply is inflammation of the heart muscle from any cause. However, the most common link to it is a viral infection. But as you can remember, with most things, there's really only one thing that causes it. And that sometimes can make it difficult to attribute exactly what the cause of myocarditis is because so many things can trigger it. <clears throat> and again, in terms of myocarditis symptoms, I've just picked a few of them. You have in the in the middle there is the is the heart and just around it. So here is your heart. And then you have chest pains, quite common. Um, shortness of breath, where people feel difficulty breathing, sometimes on minimal exertion. Fatigue, feeling quite tired, associated with flu-like symptoms. And chest pain is really strongly suggestive of uh, myocarditis. Palpitations and leg swelling, and those are just some of the symptoms. Now, it's important not to think that just because you have palpitations means that you've got myocarditis. It's, it doesn't work like that. It needs to be a constellation of symptoms that will technically tie the diagnosis together and help somebody or help the clinician to know that this is likely to be the cause. Um, so moving along, the reason why this is important, and I'll, I'll make this a full screen here, is that at the end of the day, this is 
a chart made by Outside Alan, and he is on Twitter. He does brilliant work. So some people will argue I shouldn't show this, but I haven't found anybody else who has been able to show it in such detail and using the colors really, really helps. And he shows here percentage of excess deaths. This is in the UK, non-COVID-19 by age group, sex and month. And so if you can't see it here, this is starting from 2020 and it's going all the way down to 2023, June 2023. Moving across the top, you have the age groups, 0 to 24, split into females and males, 25 to 49, 50 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, greater than 85, and then a total um, of excess mortality. So when you look at the total here, what you realize is that in terms of the colors, if you can't read the numbers, essentially light green is less than 5%. Zero is yellow. Um, slightly above zero, I should say, is 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 dark yellow or kind of um, orangish. And greater than five percent is red. Greater than ten percent is dark red. And greater than fifteen percent excess mortality is great is black. And so the concern comes about because when you look at this period of time, so this period of time is from about the middle of twenty twenty two all the way down to June of 2023. And in this age group, up to the ages of uh, 50 to 64, so this age group here, we are seeing significant rises in excess mortality. And it's very worrying when we look at the younger cohorts here as well. Now, as people say, there could be many things that are causing this. But you have to remember, I have been calling that this should be investigated. I was calling for it since... January 2022. That was the first flag in Europe. And I said, this is serious. We need to know why this is occurring. So I always use that as the baseline to explain why we need to talk about these things and why we need to focus on them. Uh, this was an old paper that I had spoken about some time ago, and it also was relevant because uh, Israel was at the, the forefront with regards to <clears throat> COVID vaccination. And so this paper here was from 2022. And what they were looking at here in this one is red represents cardiac arrests. Okay, so you can see the spikes there. Purple here represents the first vaccine doses. Blue represents the second vaccine doses. And I think the light green here was further doses beyond that. So what you would notice here is that this is in ages 16 to 39. So this is not across a whole age group. Important to remember, this age group doesn't just randomly have cardiac arrest. It really takes something significant for that to happen. But you can see this parallel rise that's occurring just around the time of vaccination. It falls off when the vaccination stops, which shows that the impact seems to be transient but then it rises again. So it's like a twofold rise with regards to cardiac arrests in Israel. And as I said, this was between 2021 and 2020. So this was a, a significant study, actually. And I, I always thought that this was very important to be delineated, especially when the low risk cohorts were um, were were being vaccinated. We needed to understand what those patterns were. So that was why I thought that that paper was very relevant. And similarly, again, this is outside Alan, looking at uh, percentage excess deaths for all causes. So the first one was non-COVID deaths. This one here is all causes. And again, the same rules apply. So across the board, since about May 2022, and you can see it here, May 2022, this is just red and black all the way through. And it begs the question as to if what we were doing was making such a huge difference, why is excess mortality so high and remaining consistently elevated across all the age groups since about the middle of 2022? It, it's important that people seem to get confused about this point. And they say that without I shouldn't say without a shadow of a doubt, but when you look at the evidence and looking around clinically, the fact that there was vaccination across large cohorts of the first world seemed to have an impact on the severity 
of COVID-19. So you saw less severe COVID-19 cases. And so ICUs were not full. But with all interventions, the question is, is not just that you cause a transition with regards to what you're targeting, but you need to also look at whether or not your intervention caused any unexpected deaths. It's kind of like when you give anticoagulation to stop strokes, but you don't measure to see if bleeds cause excess deaths. It's that kind of thing. You have to look for all the factors that are relevant in order to understand uh, stuff. This is the same thing that happened with Vioxx. It was great at protecting people's um, arthritis pain, but then it was associated with increased excess deaths. And that was relevant to what you did and how you approached the therapeutic. So these are very important questions and I'll be trying to see if I can answer some of them. And there are four myocarditis papers that I'll be focused on beyond this point. One of them is about, I mentioned it, the Big Ten um, COVID-19 cardiac registry. This was looking at athletes in, um, in, in universities in the US who got COVID and the associated myocarditis. And I'll be using this to demonstrate what we should have done. I've recently spoken about this. Circulating spike protein in a post-COVID mRNA vaccine myocarditis. Extremely important paper. Um, the sex-specific differences in myocardial injury is, is pointing out how frequently it occurs with mRNA um, vaccines. And the, the cyto, um, cytokinopathy with aberrant cytotoxic lymphocytes. I'll be trying to tie this paper with this paper to try and give an, a unique perspective on what I think is going on. So just remember, I'm sharing my own insights. This is um, what we call scientific exploration rather than necessarily scientific fact. I'm just looking at the research and applying my mind to what it could mean. So the important thing, just before I click off from our other um, people who are here, I'll have to, to leave our other platforms and continue with people who are just on Eventbrite. But the important point that I came up with, and this is where I appreciate people being interested in this research because it forced me to think carefully. And I am likely to say something that is specific to the mRNA not the technology, but the spike protein associated with it and why I think myocarditis is occurring. So very important thoughts. And for those who are um, not here, um, you can try and see if you can follow it up um, later on. 